Hey everyone, I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash, and this is episode 115 in the series. Welcome back to the Yarn Room. It's lovely to see you all. I hope you're well. We are enjoying some really bizarre weather here in... Uh, we're in New York still because we're at the end of my sabbatical, and uh, it's been in the 40s, 50s, 60s, so I'm looking outside on this sunny af Sunday afternoon. Beautiful, clear skies, and it's just kind of eerily weird for the middle of December, but... We're taking full advantage of it. Um, my husband and I, Spencer and I, and the dogs always go out walking, so we've been out every day just like shedding all of our woolly layers and enjoying just like throwing on a, a simple sweater and you know like a puffy vest or something and, and hiking for a long time, which is wonderful. As most of y'all know, I'm a professor, so uh, I'm also at the end of our semester now, sabbatical semester, so I'm turning my sights toward the spring semester, I have a grad class going on, and that's a feminist futures class. It's an online class about um, digital spaces and environments, and that'll be kind of fun to teach. So I'm thinking about that, but I'm also thinking about uh, some new knitting classes to offer. And as you guys know, uh, over on knittingthestash.com, I have three classes up already, and I'm working on the next two right now. Uh, and I'm hoping that at least one of them will be a kind of more synchronous class so we could maybe meet on Zoom once a week or so and chat or have some office hours or something where we can actually interact with each other and talk about projects and talk about what we're working on. So yeah, when when that stuff is ready to go, I will let you know. And uh, if you want to be up to date on everything that's happening, you can always subscribe to the newsletter over on the website, knittingthestash.com. I always send special little things to newsletter subscribers, and that's the best way to stay in the know with what's going on. New classes, stuff that's going on with the flock farm, your job, all that kind of stuff. So. That was a long, rattly introduction. <laughs> so for those of you who are coming back, um, welcome back. And for those of you who are new, I should have said at the beginning, this is a podcast mostly about sweater design and modification and pattern modification, DIY, all that kind of fun stuff. So in this episode, we're going to talk mostly about wear and tear on our sweaters. I get a lot of questions from you in the comments and emails to me more generally about how my sweaters have worn over time. And, you know, since this is a podcast mostly about sweaters and sweater design and sweater modification, it seemed only right that I could spend an episode talking to you about maybe the five or six, depending on if this one counts, uh, sweaters that I wear all the time and uh, how they're wearing in terms of felting and pilling and um, different kinds of things that happen with sweaters as you wear them. So we'll do a big segment on that. And I also have a very short shop update for you and at the end I have the winner of our, the final big winner of our knit along this last year which was the out of my league knit along uh, and I'll announce that at the end. So yeah, let us uh, let me do a shop update for you for those of you who are interested in the Flock Farm Yarn Shop where we do uh, indie small batch yarns and try to bring, basically bring shepherds uh, together with makers so that you all can make things from sheep that you know and love and from people that you know and love. <laughs> you know their names, you know what they're all about, and you know the, the kinds of things they're trying to do with their Farms or, farms or their flocks or their small operations. So um, so for today I have uh, some beautiful Shetland yarn. So uh, I talked about this a little bit in the newsletter that I sent out recently. I got in touch with Meg Falcone of Five Sisters Farm because she, we were kind of following each other around Instagram and she has these beautiful, adorable Shetland sheep and she kept putting beautiful pictures of them and they're kind of funny little pictures of their faces and I just thought they were really cute. So uh, I got in touch with Meg, and it turns out she is also a podcast. She knew about the podcast. She'd been following along. So it's just nice to have those kinds of connections. Uh, and Meg and I got to talking, and I asked her if it would be possible to put some of her beautiful Shetland yarn in the shop because they have been raising Shetlands for about 15 years. Uh, it's a family-run business, so all five daughters have been involved in it. started out as a 4-H project, as a lot of these kind of indie operations often start out as a 4-H project of one kind or another. And then the sheep keep coming, <laughs> and so do the fleece, and so does the yarn. So they've been using their yarn um, themselves or gifting it to friends or things like that, but very recently they've started to, uh, you know, kind of amass enough fleece to send things off to the mill uh, and start sorting things into different colors and making choices about the kind of yarn that they want to produce. And they've created a website and they're just getting started. So I thought it would be wonderful to get some of their yarn up on uh, the Flock Farm Yarn Shop. 
So this is the, these are the three colors that I have in the shop right now. The, they are, um, this is Bramble. I should probably show them in order of light to dark here. Bramble, Thistle, and Tulip. They're all a two-ply yarn. You can see there's their, this is, let's see if I can get the camera to do it. Yeah, so this is the Five Sisters Farm logo. Uh, they're all two-ply and D this is DK weight. They also have uh, fingering weight, I believe. If you want fingering weight, she has that up on her website. Uh, the, so the nice thing is that since it's DK weight, you could do, if you wanted to do a color work project that involved multiple skeins or multiple colors, you've got that right here. I thought the three of these went together really well. Meg and I kind of picked out um, some colors that we thought would be perfect to pair up together in case you wanted to get to a color work hat or a shawl or something like that. Um, and the Shetland yarn, it's, it's definitely um, a heavier weighted kind of yarn. It's not a woolen spun. Uh, it's a uh, worsted spun two ply, so, or at least at the very least a semi worsted spun. So it has a density to it. Um, it's not super, super, super duper fluffy like a woolen, 100% woolen spun yarn would be. Uh, and because of that, it's going to wear very, very well. So it would be excellent for sweaters. Of course, accessories. I mean, who wouldn't like Shetland accessories, right? Um, but sweaters, I think, would be absolutely perfect. The sweater that I'm wearing, actually, is a local to me, uh, Illinois Shetland, that I purchased from a small indie producer, <laughs> uh, actually at a coffee shop, uh, maybe maybe eight years ago or something like that. And I dyed it myself and then knit into the sweater. So this uh, sweater would also be beautiful in this Shetland yarn, I think. So like I said, this is the alias sweater. Um, but this has worn incredibly well. I'll talk about sweaters in a minute, right? Um, but Shetland yarn, especially put up like this, um, you know, in a plied semi worsted weight or semi worsted spun yarn is going to wear really well. Um, and I can highly recommend it. And I have sweater quantities in the shop. So if you're interested in getting a sweater's quantity of any of these colors, you can head over there and, and grab what you need. Yeah. So that's the latest addition to the shop. You can read an interview with Meg, who is, as I said, the primary shepherdess. She's also the mom and a veterinarian. Uh, she's had an incredibly interesting career and in life with her girls and with the sheep and with caring for animals, her own included. Uh, and so we have an interview up there, a farm feature. And I was uh, lucky enough to meet Ella, who is one of the older daughters who is away at college. And she was actually the one who kind of schlepped all the yarn out uh, New York way uh, so that we could meet and do a yarn swap um, because the farm is actually out in New Hampshire, but you know, the daughters are growing up and kind of spreading themselves out around the country. So it was fun to meet Ella and a huge thank you to Meg and Ella and all the daughters in the family for uh, making this yarn and helping to get it over into the shop. I am in love with it and I hope you guys will like it too. So that's actually kind of a perfect segue into this section on sweater wear and tear since we're talking about Shetland yarn and we're talking about uh, sweaters and wears, wear and tear and how yarn will work out over time. So let's talk about the answer to your questions, uh, which are often like, how well do my sweaters wear? What do you think of the yarn? How are they years later, months later, whatever it is, you know? Um, and I can say, first off, that uh, these two sweaters, the ones that I'm, the one I'm wearing and the one on the mannequin, have been the sweaters that are like my workhorse sweaters. I wear them most fall and winters. I will wear them interchangeably all season long. Like I love my other sweaters, but they often don't get pulled out of the bin because I just pull these on in the morning and they're warm. They have the high collar. I've talked about them before. They're my absolute favorite, really warm sweaters. This one is, is particularly dense. This one is a little bit lighter uh, in terms of its weight, but they've both worn incredibly well. So uh, this is, uh, most of the sweaters I'm gonna talk about are sweaters that were knit out of yarns that you would have access to, pretty easy access to, or somewhat easy access to. Uh, I wanted to leave this one a little bit off the charts because, like I said, it's a local to me, Shetland from Illinois, that I dyed myself, so it's not an accessible yarn to you. This one I'm, I want to kind of set aside, but I also want to tell you about it. And you're, you are 
not seeing, or you are seeing double. <laughs> so these are both alias sweaters. I've talked about this sweater a lot on here. This is an Isabel Kramer sweater. Both of them have worn just incredibly well. Like I said, I there have been seasons where I've worn one or the other of these every single day. And I think there are a couple places to check for wear that are really telling about what's going on with the yarn. Of course, the armpit. <laughs> we like to talk about armpits on here. Armpits are the biggest tell. And you can see with this guy, uh, that there's a little bit of fuzzy going on in here. Uh, normally I wouldn't just pull it all off, but this stuff actually pulls pretty well. Um, and you can see just a little bit of that pilling going on, but it's not disturbing uh, the pattern too much. I think you can probably see that there's a cable running down the side of the sweater, and the cable is pretty well preserved, even though there's a little bit of that pilling going on. Now, that is, as far as I can tell, the only place that you're really getting any substantial pilling. There's a tiny bit right here, like I can see one little pill. Eh, there we go. Uh, and even around the upper collar, which is always getting wear, uh, and you know, right up around my neck and face, it's doing great. You know, there's no, there's no pilling. I mean, this sweater looks almost like the day I made it. It's kind of crazy. And in fact, this sweater actually survived a dog attack, which I talked about on another <laughs> episode. The dogs got a hold of it, ripped the button band out, I was able to repair it, uh, and it looks like new. So even this yarn, which is the newer yarn, not newer so much, but um, you know, I took it out of my stash and re-knit part of the sweater with this. And you can see the color has faded just a little bit. There's a definite difference in color in terms of you know, the yarn that's fresh out of the ball and the sweater that's been worn. Uh, but that is really the only thing I've noticed about this sweater. I cannot believe how well this sweater has worn. Now this is uh, the Isle Yarn DK. And uh, Isle Yarn is from the UK and they name each colorway after the pastures that the sheep were raised in. So I think this is the Smeadmore or something like that uh, colorway. The sad thing about this yarn, though, is that I just went to look it up and I don't see Isle Yarn as a, like, their presence on the web is no longer. So I don't know what happened. I know you can still get their yarn from a few shops that have um, leftovers. So I'm, I was just, I was heartbroken about that because it's one of my favorite yarns. It is a uh, blend of Dorset, BFL, and Swaledale. So lots of long wool in here, which explains why there's very little pilling and very little ripping or tearing or any, you know, like wear um, going on with this sweater because you have the long wool, which if you have a staple length that's longer and less crimp, it's not as fine, you're not getting as many short little fibers that are creating the neps or that are fluffing out and pilling up. And the longer staple length means that it's just a tougher sweater. Like I said, the dogs chewed on it at one point and like they, the damage they did was relatively minimal. Uh, so this would be my number one pick for, uh, you know, finding a yarn that is a kind of long wool that wears really well. If you just want a sweater to look like it, it was just knit, I have to say, this is this yarn is pretty darn incredible. So if you can find it anywhere, Isle Yarn, this is the DK weight. They do a fingering weight as well. Uh, and if anyone knows what happened to Isle Yarn, I would love to know. I was trying to poke around online and figure out if they had said anything about what's going on, if it was the pandemic or what it was. But if anyone has any info, I'd love to know because this is a, a beautiful and incredible yarn. Um, it is plied, it is a worsted spun. So this is a three ply. Yeah, three ply worsted spun yarn, which also explains why it's wearing particularly well, I think. Yeah, so that's my number one. But let's look at a few other sweaters, okay? Quick mannequin swap out. So this is my Hikari sweater by Yamagara, and she designs, she tends to design sweaters with uh, yarns that are not 100% wool because she's uh, located in Singapore and so she's dealing with more of a warmer weather kind of situation um, than I might be dealing with in New York or Illinois. Uh, so this sweater is one that I've worn quite a lot and I've actually worn it as a base layer uh, because it is so thin and fine in terms of its weight, it's not bulky at all. So I'll often wear it underneath another sweater or underneath a coat or something like that, um, or a jacket, because it's just, it's a, it's a kind of great base layer. In fact, it's almost like a long underwear, kind of like a base layer. It's really great that way. 
Uh, and as those of you who have been following along know, uh, the sweater was originally designed uh, to have this triangle that you can see here in textured stitches, um, to have that triangle also appear on the front of the garment. So I took away the front triangle, but I left the texture on the back. Uh, it's also a sweater that has an incredibly interesting starting place and uh, construction. So I would encourage you to check it out because if you're interested in sweaters that have, they're not your run of the mill construction, this one's really pretty cool. Now, how has it worn? This is really, it's done really, really well. Um, you can see that even though I've been wearing it underneath other clothes and so it's, it's had friction all over it, not just on the sleeves of the armpits. Um, let's look at the armpits here. We got a little bit of pilling going on, just very, some very fine pills going on, not too much. Uh, and a tiny bit, if you look closely, there's a tiny bit of pilling in these areas right here where you might imagine, uh, you know, arms rubbing and things like that. But overall, it has not been a snaggy, pilly mess in any kind of way. And that's a little bit surprising to me because this yarn is... Um, this is the Amirasu Parade, and Amirasu, uh, you know, Amirasu Magazine. This is a Japanese knitting magazine, and this is a Japanese yarn. And I have the leftover ball right here that I thought I'd pull out and show you. So this is the Parade version, which is their summer blend. Let's see if the camera can do it. There you go, maybe? Yeah. So this is their summer blend, which is 60% wool, 20% cotton, 10% silk, and 10% linen. Uh, hand spun and dyed in Japan. So here's a look at the actual yarn. It is applied yarn and it is a worsted spun yarn. Spun very much, very much the feel of it is, uh, you know, a kind of cottony, linen-y yarn, even though it has 60% wool. Uh, and like I said, one of the things I was kind of surprised about is that there weren't many pills or anything because um, the linen does tend to produce these tiny little flyaway bits that you can see. It's part of the texture of the yarn. And I thought when I was originally knitting it that they would end up snagging and catching and then would pull, you know, parts of the yarn apart. That hasn't happened. And although you can see them here in a couple little places, and I'm, I'm not sure if the camera's gonna pick up on them, but maybe I can show you in the actual yarn itself. You can see the yarn has these little, I pulled one out right there so you maybe can see it, this little guy right here. It has these little bits of linen that kind of come out of it, uh, but they don't seem to affect the yarn strength or spin if they do come out. So it's worn incredibly well. And that's awesome because it's, like I said, it's a perfect base layer, being that it is that uh, this the drape of it and the fact that it's this blend of wool and cotton kind of makes it perfect for wearing underneath other clothes. So I would give a big thumbs up to that parade festive summer blend from Amirasu. This was my birthday yarn from Spencer <laughs> many years ago uh, because I really wanted to knit this sweater up in the yarn that it was called for because it seemed like such an interesting blend of yarn. I like wool cotton blends. So I was really happy to get to try it out. I did find out in looking things up for this episode that the Amirasu yarns, they do now have a North American distributor. So if you're interested in getting your hands on some of this beautiful hand-dyed Japanese yarn, you can do so without having to pay international shipping and postage. So I'll post some links to that down below. Uh, I'm actually pretty excited about that, <laughs> to know about that and to just found out about that uh, because I would like to get another sweaters uh, quantity of this yarn to make another kind of base layer. Um, whether or not it's this pattern, I don't know. And again, this pattern is totally modified. So if you look up Hikari, um, you're unlikely to see <laughs> what's here exactly. Uh, it's supposed to be, I think, a three quarter length sleeve. And like I said, the triangle in the front and the back and lots of other things, but uh, it's close enough that I think you could recognize it. So that's Hikari and that's in the Amirasu Parade yarn, which is the wool cotton blend. Again, two thumbs up. Really nice yarn. So the third yarn and sweater on the hit parade for today is the Reverb Cardigan by Tannis Lavallee. And this one was knit up in Brooklyn Tweed Shelter. And like I said, I tried to pick sweaters that I wear a lot that also have, um, they're, 
the yarn that's called for tends to be a rel relatively readily available yarn, so that we can do some actual comparisons. So this shelter for Brooklyn Tweed, if anybody's ever used it before, I'm guessing a lot of you are familiar with this one. Uh, this is a worsted weight yarn. It is uh, Targi Columbia wool, and I looked it up online, and it's, I'm trying to remember the percentage of Targi and Columbia, and I didn't think, I don't think I was able to find that as well. But the Targi wool um, is a fine wool and has a high crimp, so it's like a, I think of it as even finer than a merino even. Uh, and that's blended with a Columbia, which is more of a medium weight. And a Columbia, like a medium weight wool is also something like a Coriadale, um, which I've used in my shorn yarns. And it's a good all-purpose yarn. Uh, you know, it has a decent crimp, not a really fine crimp, and usually a long, longer staple length. So, uh, you know, Columbia and Targi together, you're going to get a little bit of the fineness and the softness, which you do get with this yarn, and some of the durability and strength from the medium wool. Uh, which is what I think they were going for. Now this is, as I said, a worsted weight yarn, but it is a woolen spun yarn. So the first two that we talked about, the Isle Yarn DK and the Amirasu Parade, are both worsted spun. And for those of you who aren't spinners, worsted spinning, or at least semi-worsted, um, usually means that all of the fibers are aligned. So they've been combed into like a top, for example. Uh, so that all those fibers are going in the same direction. So when they're spun, it's a very dense yarn because you have all the fibers going in the same direction. Uh, woolen spun yarns are carded, so they're more of like a, it's like a fluff ball. So you get a lot of air trapped in there. The fibers are going in all different directions. And then when you go to spin it, that air gets trapped in the yarn. So this is a woolen spun yarn, so it has that air trapped in it. And woolen spun yarns are wonderful for sweaters that have lots of different texture and cables because you're using so much more yarn in those areas, but if you're using a woolen yarn, it's not gonna add to the weight of the sweater. So this sweater is remarkably light compared to another sweater, or even this, this sweater if you knitted it up in a worsted weight or a semi-worsted weight yarn. So that's the, those are the pluses of using a woolen spun yarn. The negatives of using a woolen spun yarn is that they are not always as strong or as good wear, wearing yarns, like they're not as hard wearing. Uh, and I think you can see that a little bit here. This one, if you look at the armpits, you're starting to get a little bit of felting going on. It's not even pilling, it's just felting which is okay <laughs> as long as you know that that's potentially going to happen um, and you can just see that the the fibers are just basically blending together here in this high uh you know high friction kind of area the rest of the sweater is doing okay uh, if you were to look at the sleeves you'd see a lot of the pilling that's happening here especially around those high use areas you know places where you're going to be rubbing and having a lot of friction. Uh, and then I'm also seeing pilling uh, along the front of the yarn. Now this yarn does look like it has uh, some neps in it, uh, you know, it, different colored little bits, and those are definitely the, they want to kind of work their way out of the yarn because they're very, uh, very short fibers. So this one I haven't worn as long as some of the other sweaters, but it looks a little more worn up close, if that makes sense. Now, that's not, uh, it doesn't mean that I would not have knit this sweater in that yarn, or that I wouldn't knit another uh, sweater in a, a woolen spun yarn. I have several woolen spun yarn sweaters, uh, and I love them because they are light, lightweight, and they're very, very warm. They're going to be a little bit warmer than a worsted weight uh, sweater, depending on what's going on, uh, but yeah. they they do have this tendency to pill a little bit more, to show their wear a little bit more, and even, like I said, to felt a little bit more in those high friction areas. Those are just things to think about. So this one's a little bit surprising to me because I did just knit it up last spring in anticipation of this fall, so I haven't even had this one a full year, but it looks as if I've had it for quite a few years. That's my sense of looking at it compared to other sweaters, especially, say, compared to that sweater that was knit up with the long wool, the Isle Yarn DK. This is what the yarn looks like up close. It is a plied yarn. It is not a singles yarn. Uh, and it is a two-ply yarn, very loosely plied 
together. Uh, and I think that part part of what's going on here is the fact that you have the targi in there, which is that shorter staple length. So when you have a shorter staple length, those fibers tend to want to work their way out of the twist. And that's partially where you get the pilling. But it's also because it is a woolen spun yarn and it, it's, it's uh, not as strong of a... In this particular case, the way that it was spun, it's also not a super strong yarn. Uh, so you're going to have that tendency to have the, the fibers be a little bit more breakable. And, and if they're a little more breakable, they're going to pill a little bit more and produce some of that um, felting that you're going to see. So it's not uh, just a throw out the baby with the bathwater kind of a situation. I think there's a real place for woolen yarn. And I think this yarn is lovely and beautiful and light and warm. You just want to know what you're getting into in terms of wear and tear. And like I said, this sweater is less than a year old and it looks a little bit older than that. All right, number four on the sweater hit parade is the Muinir sweater by Albina McLaughlin. And this one I actually didn't knit. As those of you who have been following along for the podcast for a long time know, this was a gift from Albina. Uh, and it is knit up in Let Lopi yarn. And I know that right now Lopi yarn is difficult to come by in a lot of colors. So I know a lot of you who have been trying to knit up uh, sweaters such as this one or sweaters from the new Lincoln Newman book or any number of other uh, sweaters that are knit up in Lopi yarn, it's, t it's difficult to get right now. But I do believe that it is a yarn that's going to be here with us for a long time. So it's, it's a good one to think about in terms of how it wears in these sweaters. So Lopi yarn, uh, I have some here because Albina sent this along, um, maybe was this two years ago or three years? It might have been three years ago that she sent me the sweater. Uh, this is the same color that you see up in the yoke. She sent me a couple extra balls in case I want to do some modifying, and I did. I added some length to the sweater. Uh, she had sent me a cropped version, so I popped the ribbing off and lengthened it. Anyway, this is what it looks like. And I think there's a misperception, even for myself when I first started working with Lopi yarn, that it's a singles yarn, uh, because it looks like a singles yarn. But if you uh, actually dig into it a little bit, it is a lightly plied yarn, and there are at least two plies in this one. You can see those two being wound up together. But because it's so, uh, like, the way that it's spun, it ends up looking like a single ply yarn. So it is a plied yarn, a two ply yarn. It's an Icelandic yarn, and uh, Icelandic fleece, Icelandic sheep produce. Uh, wool that has um, an outer coat and an inner, it's the tog and the tell. So the tog, the tog I think is the um, longer, hairier part, and then the tell is the kind of soft, downy stuff closer to the coat of the sheep. And a lopi yarn tends to spin those two things together. Um, and when you spin those two things together, you get the cool properties of the outer, kind of more hairy part that's more water resistant and all that kind of good stuff. And then you also have the thel, that downy part that's closer to the sheep's body. And that is uh, a lot like a soft merino. It's very warm. It's very, um, it's, it's soft. You know, it's going to produce, so you get kind of the best of both worlds when you get this yarn. So a lot of uh, lopi yarn is used to produce sweaters that you would wear for outerwear. Uh, meaning that, you know, it would be one of your last layers, if not the last layer. Perhaps you'd throw it on over your turtlenecks and your long underwear and whatever other base layers you were wearing, and this could potentially be your outerwear if you're going to go out cross-country skiing or hiking or whatever it is, you know, out in the cold. And that is absolutely true. I've worn this sweater out in the cold with just a down puffy over it, and it, it works really, really well. I've been wearing this sweater for at least two, if not three years. Like I said, I wore it for the first year with the cropped version, then I added the length to it so that it's a longer version now, which makes it even warmer. Uh, so it's been in heavy rotation for the last couple of years, out and about on dog walks, out and about doing construction work, moving things, lots and lots of friction, you know, carrying things, arms, like all that kind of stuff. And let's look at the armpits. So we've got a little bit of pilling here, it looks like, and it looks like a little bit of wear. Um, I can see a tiny little hole right there and a tiny little hole right there. And what I would do is take my extra yarn and go in there and darn that up. And I think it would be just about as good as new. You can see the rest of the sweater 
is showing very little wear. <laughs> There's not pilling going on. It's not felting. Uh, none of that is happening in the armpits with the exception of that tiny little... It looks like it's the hole when you join um, the rest of your sleeve after you separate for the yoke. It looks like the yarns that were separated there didn't get quite woven in strongly enough maybe at the time uh, for this particular uh, sample sweater. So I will just go in and mend that little hole and it'll be good as new because as, I sh as I'm showing you here, there's no other real wear. There's a little pilling right over here, you know, right where your arms would rub. I see two or three little pills. I'm not seeing much of anything in the yoke or up by the neck. And if you can see this kind of furry halo, that's the longer part of the Icelandic wool. It does tend to produce this kind of, you know, there's a little bit of hairiness about Icelandic yarn, lopy yarn that you see, but that's not related to wear at all. That's just, it's just how it is. So I'm not seeing any kind of pilling, tiny bit of pilling in the armpit here, but the pills are also just coming off. They're not attached. It's not the kind of thing where you're going to need to snip it very carefully or, or anything like that. Um, so I would say really two thumbs up on this one. Icelandic lopy yarn, if you can get your hands on it, <laughs> makes excellent sweaters, hard wearing, uh, good for outdoor wear, lots of different wear. I've worn this one every day for weeks at a time and it's hardly showing anywhere at all. So excellent recommendation then for the Let Lopey yarn once it's back in stock and you can get a hold of it. Uh, really excellent for sweater wear, I'd say. Okay, last but certainly not least, uh, this is my Nasrin sweater and it's actually brand new. I just finished this one um, a very close to the reverb one that I showed you before. So this one was just finished this past summer and it is knit up in Lichen and Laces uh, Rustic Heather Sport, which I absolutely love. This is Lichen and Lace, they're a Canadian co company, woman-owned company. This is in the colorway Birch, and this is 100% Canadian wool. It's a big blend of a lot of different um, sheep and fleece that you'd find up in Canada, and it's spun at a Canadian mill, and it is a uh, woolen spun, it's a sport weight. Now this is, I think this is the only singles yarn that I have in a sweater for today. And this sweater again, like I said, just finished it this summer, have been wearing it. <laughs> I've been interchanging this one with the um, Mounier sweater, the one I just showed you, the Icelandic one. Uh, so I'll wear like this one for a week and then I'll wear the other one for a week. So it's been heavily worn for, you know, the last couple of months, let's say. So this is the newest of the sweaters. It's also the only singles yarn sweater that I'm showing you today. And by singles, I mean it is not plied. So if you look at the lichen and lace yarn, it is a singles yarn. There is not a ply to it as there is not even a hidden ply like there is with the uh, Let Lopey. So it's a very single ease kind of yarn. It is strong though, relatively strong, stronger than that Brooklyn Tweed. There it goes. But it does have a little bit of a tear away factor going on. So let's look at the sweater. Uh, it is, let's look at the armpits. Wearing pretty well. Uh, I'm not seeing too much specific friction, felting, pilling going on in the armpits, which is a good sign. But I am seeing pilling all over the a little bit on the main body and definitely on the sleeves so i'm not sure if you can see this on the camera but the sleeves are just covered in these tiny little pills and yes you shouldn't really just pull your pills off but i'm just doing it to show you you really should shave them or cut them in a with a very specific pair of scissors so you don't accidentally pull the rest of your yarn out um, but i am seeing these pills showing up all over the sleeves which is interesting and makes me think that once we get further into the season with the sweater, I'm going to start seeing that more in the main body of the sweater as well. And I think you can already, you can already see a little bit of it. There are some pillows coming out around the body of the sweater. Not terrible, but enough that makes me think, okay, this sweater may need some more, uh, tender love and care than some of my other sweaters and it may need a little bit of a uh, less time in the rotation between you know repairs or mending or making sure that I shave it off or whatever it is that I want to do to keep it looking fresh and new. Um, so like I said I've been wearing this one pretty much 
in rotation for the last couple of months and it's starting to show a little bit of wear and I think that is because of the woolen spun uh, yarn and because of the singles nature of the yarn that it's not plied. So the plies often will catch some of those shorter smaller fibers but a singles yarn isn't doesn't have any way to catch any of those small ones so they're just kind of already working their way out in these pills. Um, yeah but I love this yarn. I have probably another couple sweaters worth of this yarn and this is the second sweater that I've knit out of it. It is a dream to wear. It's soft and pliable and comfortable and it kind of molds to your body so I have to say that those things you know it's <laughs> none of these none of these evaluations are uh, make or break. It's really just knowing a little bit more about the yarns themselves and how they're wearing um, to help you decide if you want to have a sweater that's maybe a little bit more uh, of a, a piece that you wear less frequently but absolutely love because you want to care for it and keep it for many years or you just want to knit two or three of them so you can just keep them in heavy rotation, then you know that this yarn, it, you know, how it might wear just a little bit if you're going to use it for a sweater. I would do it again because <laughs> I love this sweater and I love this yarn and in fact I will do it again because I have another sweater's quantity in my stash over there. <laughs> so this is the Nasrin by Isabel Kramer, knit up in lichen and lace in the rustic heather sport. 100% uh, wool, singles, woolen, uh, spun yarn, and lovely yarn. Doesn't wear as well as a long wool or an Icelandic or a plied yarn, but that's to be expected. So that's my tour through uh, five or six of my sweaters that I wear all the time uh, so that you can see how they wear because I do get questions uh, about how the yarns work out, how the sweaters work out over time. And that's something that you won't know uh, as a knitter, especially a new knitter, if, if you're using a new yarn or um, using it with a new pattern, you won't necessarily know those things until you've worn the sweater for quite some time to see how it's actually working out. So I hope that's a little bit helpful in terms of thinking through what kind of yarn uh, you might want to use, whether or not you're thinking about the breed, whether it's a long wool or short wool, whether it's a mix like the Icelandic of the, the Thog and the Thel, um, how it's spun, how it's plied, uh, and just thinking about how it might turn up in a pattern. We've talked a lot on here about, you know, using singles and two plies for lace patterns and using three plies or more for cables, um, and all of those things matter. So it just, it just depends on what combo you're going to put together for the sweater that you're knitting and then thinking about how it might wear. But some of, some of the factors that we've talked about are things to take into account if you're trying to decide between one yarn and another and you're thinking about a sweater that you have um, in your queue for a particular purpose. Like, I wouldn't necessarily wear this one as my outerwear sweater if I'm going to go be tossing around in the snow when I could put on my Icelandic sweater and that would wear a little bit better and be a little bit more protected no matter what I'm doing with it. Whereas this one I might want to save for going into the office or uh, for around the house or things like that where it's not going to experience quite as much stress and wear and tear. So these are all just choices that you make and then you have the sweaters and you think about how you want to wear them and what you want to do with them and how you want to care for them and there are just so many different factors. So I hope that helps a little bit and I'd love to hear your thoughts on the wear and tear of sweaters, the ones that you've been wearing the longest and how those yarns are performing for you over time. So last but certainly not least, uh, I want to give a huge shout out to um, Sue Sitko who created some beautiful jewelry for me and then offered to uh, give a prize to someone who's been knitting uh, either in one of my classes or uh, has been inspired by some of the podcast things that we've been doing. So the, we've been working this last year on the Out of My League Cal and you guys have posted amazing projects over in our Ravelry thread so I hope you'll go and look and see what, what other uh, makers are doing over there. There's some incredible color work and cables and lace and people challenging themselves to do things that they didn't think they could do. And so congratulations to everyone because I think most of you came away with a pattern and a project that you feel like you can be really proud of. It's something that you weren't sure you could do before when you started knitting but now you've tackled it and Way to go. That's amazing. So Sue offered this prize and I thought, well, this might actually be the perfect place to put it. So 
Of all of the fi finished pieces from the cowl, uh, I selected randomly uh, Jean, who's Silas M on Ravelry. So Jean, I've already sent you a notification and I think Sue has been in touch with you, but you're gonna get a set of jewelry to match one of your beautiful new sweaters. So congratulations. Thank you so much again to Sue for uh, offering this wonderful prize as a kind of end goal for those of us who have been working on this out of my league cowl. And yeah, we gotta come up with a new cow for the new year. So that'll be in the next episode along with that uh, lace chart design uh, information. So we'll get to some other fun stuff in episode 116. For now, I hope you all are well and that you will be going through your sweaters and thinking about the yarns that you're using. And I will see you probably after the new year, though I might sneak one more episode in before all of the festivities that we have going up in a couple of weeks. So take care and I will see you soon. Bye-bye.